This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. Grods. Hello, Dr. Grods. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm fine. You're my first guest. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Dr. Grods. This is Vincent Racaniello. Uh, Vince, uh, so I am talking to the click and clack of parasitology. <laughs> yeah. You got it. You got it. <laughs> yes. Mostly click. <laughs> I know your name for years because your son was a student here. That's correct. He was in, yeah, I, in fact, my department, microbiology. That's right. Uh, I saw him a few times while he was there. Indeed. And he's still at the NIH. He works for NCBI. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah? Yes. What does he do? Uh, he does annotations. Wow. Wait a minute. We're wasting this. We should be talking about this on the air. All right. Well, let's start. <laughs> we'll, we'll go through the usual. All right. So we're going to just interview you, Bob. You're free to say whatever you'd like. Go ahead. This Week in Parasitism. Episode number 28, recorded on May 3rd, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and of course with me is Dixon de Palmier. Hello, Vince. How you doing, Dixon? I'm doing very well. Dixon has his black shirt and black pants. He does. I have my lecture uniform black on. Black <laughs> shoes, black headset. <laughs> That's right. He's ready to go. I am, because we have a special guest. And why don't you introduce I will. Our, special, our first ever guest on TWIP. This is correct. And who else should it be but a very good friend of mine, Dr. Robert W. Grads at the NIH. Hello, Bob. How are you doing? We're doing very well. What's the weather like down there? Oh, it's beautiful. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. Uh, <laughs> spring is spring is well in here. Yeah. How's your backyard I doing? Still, is it still snowing in New York? <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> Have you got your, your train set up in the backyard yet? Uh, no, uh, but it... Pretty soon, I have to. I have to do the pond first and make ah, yes. the koi happy. Ah, yes. You know, uh, Bob has a fantastic backyard fence. He's, really, it's amazing. He's got a swimming pool. He's got toy trains, but these are not toy trains. They're huge, uh, and they're replicas of actual trains. Bob will tell you more about those. But uh, they're, they're G gauge. G gauge. Wow. G -gauge. G gauge. So they're a lot bigger than the Lionel, but yeah. not not big enough to ride on. <laughs> What's the scale of G gauge? Well, it's the, the G gauge is the gauge. I mean, uh, how many feet per inch? Oh, I don't know. It's the reduction number. Because I think O is a quarter inch per foot or something like that. Yeah. Could be. But these are these are fairly large. Could and be. Uh, can you ride them? No, but Not you can put a beer can on a, uh, on a car <laughs> and, and, and drive it around. Exactly. Now, so what are your other hobbies, Bob? What other things do you do in the backyard? Well, aren't they enough? Right now, it's probably uh, world travel. Right. I just, I just got back from... Two weeks in Poland. That was a good visit, wow. I hope. Yes, I was teaching there. Excellent. At the Jagiellonian University. Ah, uh -huh. I know that one. You do. When was when was the Jagiellonian University founded? Oh, brother, it must have been by Kepler. <laughs> I don't know when. Uh, well, Copernicus was a student there. <sighs> wow. Thirteen sixty-four. My goodness gracious. <laughs> so it's the third oldest in Europe. That's fantastic. And. So when you give lectures there, though, Bob, you don't speak much Polish, as I recall. No, I, I can pray and swear. But uh, <laughs> they, in fact, have, a, in addition to their regular Polish curriculum, they have an English language curriculum. Oh, great. And most of my students were Norwegian. Really? Yes. Ha! And they all speak English because nobody speaks they Norwegian, all, I guess. Uh, no, they speak Norwegian, but they speak English also perfectly. Right. Exactly. Were you born in Poland? No. My great or my grandparents came over before the 1900s. Right. So I grew up in Chicago, exactly. as a good Polish American would. Indeed. My <laughs> wife's mother was Polish. Her parents were from Poland, but they moved to Western Canada, and she was born there. Huh. Okay. And but uh, her name was Halwa. So, so when I say Yakshamash, does that help? No. <laughs> no. I never learned anything. You know, she's my mother-in-law. I never listened right. to her. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bob, tell us a little about your academic background. Well, I did my undergraduate training at Notre Dame. 
uh, graduated in 1962, and then went into the Navy for four years. Right. Uh, and so I'm a Vietnam veteran and a nuclear weapons specialist and all sorts of things. Indeed. Uh, then I came back, uh, not knowing where I would go after four years in the Navy. I ended up back at Notre Dame and got a Ph.D. there. Right. Then did a postdoc at Harvard. Right. And then went to the NIH, and I've been with the NIH for 39 years. Exactly. In fact, Bob and I knew each other as classmates at Notre Dame while we were graduate students. Wow. So that's great. So you must like each other. You stayed in touch, we right? We liked each other more than that. We actually wrote this book together. <laughs> That's right. I have it right in front of me here. That's right. So you are one of the co-authors of Parasitic Diseases. That's correct. So uh, Dixon wants to know if you're going to rewrite your chapters. <laughs> well, <laughs> we've been talking we're, we're, about it. Let's say that we're in negotiation. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, don't hope to get any money out of Dixon. <laughs> but, you must, <laughs> but you must know that. <laughs> Oh, come on. Don't be so harsh. Well, there is a Bentley parked down out in front with the apple trees uh, license plate, isn't there? That's no, right. no, no, no. That's uh, that's Saul Silverstein's. <laughs> yeah, that's my, my virology colleague here. So, so Bob, what did you do? Why don't you tell us what you did as a postdoc at uh, Harvard? Because that's interesting work, I think. Well, can I ask well, you, did yeah, you, sure. did you uh, work with on Trichinella at Notre Dame, as did Dixon? You didn't work No, no, no. I, I was... I did my, my thesis on reproductive physiology of Aedes aegypti. I probably know more about what makes uh, female mosquitoes have sex than anybody would want to know. Wow. <laughs> Tremendous. And, and who I, did you work with? Uh, with the fellow by the name of George Craig. Exactly. Uh, who was okay. a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Yeah. And One of our heroes. Things. One of our heroes. Yeah. And he was uh, interested in mosquitoes as well, he mosquitoes? Was or yeah. as, Well... Mosquitoes as they relate to the transmission of diseases. Okay. That's uh, right. Aedes aegypti is the yellow fever mosquito. It's all, all, also the primary vector of uh, dengue fever. So it's really a very important mosquito. Uh, and then and for many years, it was the standard mosquito. If you worked on mosquitoes, you worked on Aedes aegypti because it's easy to maintain in the laboratory. Yep. Uh, it's a very robust mosquito. I viewed myself for many years... Uh, as the world's second best mosquito brain surgeon, <laughs> who was the first best? Uh, the, the man who taught me yeah. down at uh, down in Florida, but ah. uh, and it takes a very steady hand and very fine tools, and uh, I could do marvelous things. I could take uh, you know secretory cells out of the brain. I could take glands out of the neck, and I also could create the exploding mosquito. <laughs> what what is that? Well, if you cut the ventral nerve cord in the right place on a mosquito, it no longer can sense the size of the blood meal it's taken. <laughs> so oh, the so the Gary Larson joke is correct, then, in some so, ways. <laughs> so the mosquito starts feeding, and she gets bigger and bigger, and she will take in about four times the normal amount of blood and then explode and then continue to feed. So if she's on your arm, you can see your blood pouring out wow. of the ruptured side of this mosquito, and she just continues to go on and feed because she doesn't know any better. Amazing. So you can sever this nerve. It has no other effect on the mosquito. Well, it, uh, it, it no, it does not. Wow. It, it That's amazing. Um, the mosquito can live for days and weeks after that. Do you still do I'll such uh, manipulations of mosquitoes? Uh, no. It, as you get older, your hand starts to shake <laughs> a little bit. and uh, Plus dissipation and, 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 and right. wild living and all that stuff. It all catches up eventually, it doesn't it? It catches up to you, yes. <laughs> so what did you do as a postdoc? Uh, I worked with Andy Spielman in the School of Public Health, and I worked on uh, a number of things, including uh, some of the hormones that uh, affect egg development in mosquitoes. And then I worked with a fellow by the name of Eli Chernin, yes. who was a parasitologist, yeah. and I worked on uh, oral transmission of uh, filariasis. Now, have you guys had the filariasis lecture yet? We have. Yeah, we you recorded have. it, although it hasn't yeah. been. We haven't put it up yet, though, Bob. Well, the you know Manson wrongfully thought that um, filariasis was a waterborne disease. That mosquitoes took only one blood meal after they became infected. The worm would develop in the mosquito, and when she went to lay her egg, she would die on the water surface, liberating the infectious stages of the worm into the water. You would drink the water. You would become infected. That's what he thought. Uh, that he thought. Yes. Uh, wrongfully, because, in fact, the worms come out when the mosquito feeds a second time after about a week or so yes. and uh, enter the wound that the, the, the mosquito has made while she's feeding. Uh, okay. 
what I showed was, in fact, that you can, a mosquito dying on the water surface does liberate worms, that if you take that water containing the worms and put them into the mouth of a of an animal, in this case a gerbil, the gerbil becomes infected. So that, in fact, Manson wasn't totally wrong. It probably has happened once or twice in history, but uh, <laughs> it is, it's certainly not epidemiologically important. Right. So there is someone, here is someone, Dixon, who knows more about mosquitoes than you do. Oh, my God. I learned everything from him. From him. Because Are I'm always kidding? impressed at what Dixon knows. No, you shouldn't mosquitoes. be. Well, well, Dixon Bob knows thinks a lot, I get it. He thinks I, I get it wrong. I, I, I listened to a few. <laughs> learning late about this uh, this podcast, I, I listened to a few of them, and at least on the malaria and then the introductory, I already caught him in a number of oh. glaring errors. Glaring. Oh, glaring. Yeah. Well, you're free to correct those because that's Well, me. one of them. Well, Come on, Bob. That, Don't hold back. You, know, you didn't didn't list the tenophores as uh, parasitic. You're right, I didn't. <laughs> What's that? Uh, you excluded Sir, them, and ocean, there isn't, in like fact, a jellies. parasitic tenophore. I had no and idea, I had no idea. called gastrodes, and it... I'm remiss. It, uh, it's not in it, our book. It parasitizes salpa. Do oh you guys know God. what salpa is? Now you, no. You're going to tell us, though, I bet. It's, it's a free-living tunicate. <laughs> what is a tunicate? Uh, you'll tell us that, too, I bet. It's a hemichordate. It's that's almost right. us. That's right. Well, it's related to it's amphioxus, almost, I guess, right? That's right, yes. So, you know, but it's not in our book, Bob. Come on. Of course it's, but ours is human <laughs> parasitology. <laughs> oh, that's, that's true. Right. That's true. You're right. So yeah. what else did I miss? I, I, you know, this is, oh, well, you, you is going to take up the, the whole show, Bob. I, I think you messed up, messed up the history of, of, of malaria and its uh, early discovery days. You know what? You're free to correct that now because you've got well, the floor. Well, why don't, I, why don't I do that in sort of a, a more uh, rational way, you know, and, and, and sort of give you my uh, yeah. introductory uh, there you le go. lecture in Polish. Uh, sure. Uh, why don't you – so you are um, – Currently, now you're chief of the lab of malaria and vector research, no, right? I'm the assistant chief of the laboratory of malaria. Oh, assistant okay. chief. Okay. Okay. Uh, to... So, what are your duties, basically? Well, my duties are to run the lab. Uh, I just passed out the terrible budget information that uh, the readjustment of the budget since we took uh, a hit in the rescission of yeah. a few weeks ago. Uh. And uh, I run two international programs. I run our international program in Mali. That's very famous. By where I'm way. going in a couple of weeks. And yeah. I run our international program in Cambodia, where I'll be going in two months. Hopefully, they won't be fighting with the uh, Thai people. Uh, it's a long way from it. And it's, it's interesting, you know, they're... Uh, the countries are right next to each other, and there's no animosity except at that one border point. Exactly, exactly. We've uh, Actually, Bob is telling the audience something that I would like to also emphasize, and that is that we've been friends for how many years, Bob? Well, Ever since uh, we met at Notre Dame, right? Uh, back in 1964. Right. So that would have been part, no, uh, uh, it's more like 68, 65. 67, because I didn't come back to graduate school until 66. Well, I graduated in 67, so it couldn't have been yep. longer than that. Right. So. <laughs> We so knew each other for about a year. So, yeah. The point is that since Bob has been at the NIH, how many students have I funneled down through your programs to go abroad? Oh, quite a few. Probably at least 20. Yeah. What do you mean fun uh, to go abroad? So in a fourth-year well, medical elective in the tropics. I see. Okay. And these students have all had a very rewarding experience. Some, Many have gone to Mali and to places that Bob has recommended. So Bob has really been a very uh, fantastic uh, facilitator for opening the eyes of young doctors to the real world of what it's really like out there. And what would they do in Mali, for example? Do you tell them, Bob? <laughs> well, the the people from medical school actually uh, did rounds every day in one of the uh, local hospitals. And it's very interesting to read the reports at the end of their stay, which mm -hmm. when it was where from a month to sometimes three months, mm -hmm. uh, that they would see more crazy diseases in a day than they would see in six months uh, doing rounds at Columbia. Absolutely. Uh, see diseases that they thought had disappeared as being very common diseases in, in Mali. Mm -hmm. uh, Pott's disease, apparently, which is uh, tuberculosis of the bone or something like that. You almost never see it in the U.S. now, mm -hmm. but they would see two cases in an afternoon. And uh, the, the, people, the problem is that people come to the hospitals uh, not to be cured, but to die, yeah, yeah, yeah. because they've exhausted all the uh, 
literally the witch doctors and the herbal healers and then the local uh, district physicians and, and regional physicians, and then they finally get referred to a hospital. And uh, they're usually in such bad shape at that point that there's yep. not much that they can do for them. Yep. But uh, at any rate, all of them came back with their eyes wide open, and uh, they wanted to go back and do it again. Right. So it was terrific. So I'm and that sorry was to the interrupt. Purpose. I don't no, want to keep interrupting you because I would love you to regale <laughs> us with your experience. Well, you know, the, the the whole business of of insects. Why are insects important? Right. Uh, in medicine is because. Uh, in the main, they take blood, some of them take blood meals. There are, uh, five major groups that, uh, have blood feeding representatives. There are, uh, 14 families in these groups. So, you know, the, the diptera, the flies have a lot of blood feeders. The true bugs, the hemiptera have blood feeders. The lice are blood feeders. Fleas are blood feeders. And then the, the ticks and mites are blood feeders. And yep. so we've got, more than 400 genera and almost uh, 15,000 species that uh, take blood as a major part of their life cycle. That's amazing. So, uh, and then there's a whole batch of insects that uh, don't feed on blood per se, but feed on tissue, and 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 most of those are are the um, mag maggots of different fly species, and we might get a chance to mention those at the end. Sure. But but where did medical entomology get started? That's right. You, you, where you did started it with get Theobald started? Theobald Smith. <laughs> I would start with somebody probably more famous in in some uh, areas at least, and that's Hildegard of Bingen. Have you ever <laughs> heard of Hildegard of Bingen? I, I'm not. I'm not. I have to she admit, she was I'm a twelfth twelfth century abbess and mystic, apparently one of the most prolific composers. Of the medieval oh, era, really? there are more than eighty uh, uh, musical pieces that are attributed to her. Wrote dozens of books and, and treaties and all that. But she and she's considered the, uh, in this case, mother of holistic medicine. I'll be darned. So there's a whole foundation in the U.S. called the Hildegard Foundation or something like that huh. uh, for holistic medicine. That is uh, traceable to her. I've never heard she, you say that before. Well, I, I, <laughs> I, I still learn. I still learn. <laughs> but in in 1150, she published a paper showing that scabies was uh -huh. caused by a mite. She could see the mites under certain conditions, not with a microscope or anything like that, and she treated them with sulfur, and it worked, and it cured wow. the people. Wow. And it, it wasn't until the 17th century where uh, an Italian, God help us, <laughs> Giov <laughs> Giovanni Bonomo, Sorry, using, <laughs> using a, an early microscope, uh, actually saw the mites uh, and described the mites, drew pictures of the mites. And so uh, it wow. really, really clarified the whole story on scabies. Cool. Uh, you know, you talked about, uh, in, in one of your first uh, lectures, uh, you know who first? Uh, who was the first medical entomologist? Who first showed that that insects could uh, were involved in the transmission of a disease? Yeah, I thought I but, mentioned Theobald Smith, but uh, you you went with Theobald Smith, but actually Sir, Sir Patrick Manson was the guy. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I said uh, corrected. <laughs> Man Manson uh, was quite a character. Work. He was a British, actually a Scot physician, working in China working with patients with filariasis and found that uh, that the mosquito was involved in the transmission. And his first paper in 1877 was uh, Filaria sanguinis hominis, which is what they call the worm, with the mosquito as the nurse. Ah. So he knew that the mosquito was taking a blood meal. The worm developed in the uh, mosquito. Right. He erroneously thought it was liberated into the water. Uh, more, uh, almost... Well, Manson was the founder of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and went on to a major role in, uh, sure. in tropical medicine in England, but he was also the mentor of Ronald Ross, yes. uh, who, in my mind, was not the brightest of bulbs. And that's why he, that's why he ended up in, uh, India. the Indian Medical Service. <laughs> right. And, uh, and it was only under the, the mentorship and actually the the pushing of of uh, Manson did Ross 
make his discoveries. Right. Okay. Uh, and we'll get to the, maybe those in, a, in a, a bit. But, you know, also in the history of uh, the, the golden age, really, of medical entomology was from about 1875 to 1900. Uh, Carlos Finley in 1881 never demonstrated, but made a very strong argument that uh, Aedes aegypti was the vector of yellow fever. Uh, Theobald Smith in about 1889 showed that ticks transmitted uh, Babesia. Bruce, TC flies and trypanosomes in 1895. Uh, Paul Louis Simond, in, I guess in 1898, showed fleas were involved in plague. Uh, then we come to the uh, mosquito story, which I'll just come right back to. But Walter Reed in 1900 showed that mosquitoes working in uh, Cuba were involved in the transmission of yellow fever. And then uh, soon thereafter, Nicole working uh, with lice showed that they were involved in the transmission of typhus. So you have this 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 25 years or so of really intense uh, discovery. Not that 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 they they solved any of the problems. Right. Uh, but I'd like to go back since I'm I'm so interested in the history of the things is, is the business between Ross and Grassi. Grassi was in fact the Italian who did uh, the work. Ross, as I said, was this fumbling, bumbling uh, physician who worked in India and kept getting these letters from Manson saying, follow the flagellum. <laughs> that is, they, they, uh, the Nobel Prize for malaria went to Lavaran in 1870, and that was for demonstrating the presence of the parasite using the Romanovsky stains, which you mentioned, uh, in the blood of a... Uh, of a soldier in North Africa, a French soldier in North Africa. Right. Uh, sometime later, McCallum, uh, I think a Canadian, but a medical student at Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins working on the summer, uh, working uh, at a bio station in the summer in Canada, saw, first saw the fertilization of the, of the malaria parasites mm-hmm. in the blood of a crow. Uh, but then getting back to uh, Ross, uh, as I say, he, he, he didn't know anything about mosquitoes. Uh, the best he could do was talk about brindled mosquitoes, which were Aedes aegypti, uh, gray mosquitoes, which were Culex, and dappled winged mosquitoes, which were the Anophelines. Uh, he finally figured out that he could transmit the parasite from one sparrow to another, not canaries, but he used sparrows. He could uh, transmit it, uh, transmit malaria from sparrow to sparrow using uh, uh, the Culex mosquitoes. Now, it's interesting that the parasite he worked with was Plasmodium relictum, which does infect canaries, by the way. Mm-hmm. But it's a, a not uncommon uh, parasite in, in birds flying around New York City. Uh, Plasmodium relictum was first described as a species, and his name is attached to it, by an Italian, Battista Grassi, probably around uh, 1890. So ten year, or eight years before Ross began to work on it, uh, Grassi had already described the uh, bird parasite and given it a name. Hmm. So while Ross was working in one place, Grassi was working in another, Grassi more working on the humans, and they already knew that... Uh, that uh, human malaria was transmitted by the Anophelines. So they published almost simultaneously. I think Ross might have been a little bit ahead. But in generosity, they should have given the uh, Nobel Prize to both of them. Uh, Ronald Ross refused to accept such a thing. And so they called in a referee, the Nobel Committee. The, no- the, the referee was uh, Robert Koch. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, Robert Koch, after his Nobel Prize with TB, uh, went down to Italy to study malaria. He was going to solve that problem now. Uh, he went to work in Grassi's lab. And apparently Grassi uh, made some comments about how inept he was as a uh, research scientist, uh, didn't know how to new- use a microscope, wondered how he ever got the Nobel Prize in the first place. And, oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> An Italian does not tell a German <laughs> Nobel laureate that he's a Dumkoff. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now Koch is the referee between uh, who should get the prize, uh, <laughs> Ross or Grassi. Grassi didn't stand a chance. <laughs> and, 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 and that ended that story there. So that's pretty much the history of the whole business. Uh, well, wait a minute. You played a role in this too, though. 
Yes, you did. <laughs> well, on the hypnozoite? Yes, mm -hmm. of course. Yes. Well, I, I'm one of the many people who was involved in the, the study, uh, which was at the Delta Primate Center in Louisiana, where we infected uh, a chimpanzee with a relapsing malaria and then uh, were able to uh, take a slice of liver out and find the uh, the dormant stage of the relapsing malaria. Yeah, that. that was a long time after the discovery of malaria. Though, oh, right? yeah. Well, the, the whole thing of relapse was short in Garnum probably in the 1940s. Garnum is the, the dean, mm -hmm. or uh, the late dean of world malariologist, probably the most prolific of researchers. And Garnum was part of the study in, uh, in Louisiana. Yes. Yes. He uh, is one of the co-authors of that paper. So Indeed. I'm very proud to be on a, on a paper with PCC Garnum. Well, I'm proud to know you. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have talked about a lot of the diseases which are transmitted and are yes. absolutely dependent. Uh, That's right. uh, you talked to, uh, you've talked about, uh, African trypanosomiasis. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, did, have you talked about American trypanosomiasis? Yep. yep. Chagas. Yep, we did. Chagas. You've talked about malaria. Yep. Leishmaniasis, too. Plague. Yep. Typhus. No, no, those are bacterial diseases. Well, they're still important because... No, but you can discuss those because we were discussing yes. the eukaryotic parasites. That's what the yeah. show features. And 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 your other show talks about the viruses. The I don't know other how group. You... That's right. So no, wait a minute. Yes. Vince has a third program. It's called This Week in Bacteriology. Microbiology. Okay. Oh, microbiology. microbiology. I'm sorry. That's yeah. really microbiology. And we talk about mostly micro then you bacteria. Can do prokaryote. Yeah. Microbes. Prokaryotes right. and archaea. That's right. Yeah, but the, but the mosquitoes are, are and, and some they of the other <laughs> uh, insects are very important in transmitting viruses. Absolutely, of course. The, the whole uh, mass of, of arbovirology is is a so, field unto itself. Right. So yellow fever and dengue and uh, all the rickettsia that the, the ticks transmit, uh, uh, an important uh, yep. viral disease in Europe is tick-borne encephalitis, mm -hmm. uh, and they even immunize in Austria against tick-borne encephalitis. Mm -hmm. And, and and Lyme disease, Lyme borreliosis, is sure. is equally important in uh, in Europe as it is in, not not as bad as it is in the United States, but it is uh, right. a very serious problem. So we've got an enormous number of diseases uh, that are transmitted by uh, by insects. So who's uh, doing all the training in this area then? Well, that's that's the problem. Uh, medical entomology has. Uh, a discipline, I think, is 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 a thing of the past. Uh, everything has gone molecular, so much so that uh, people don't talk about life cycles anymore. They don't talk about uh, how the mosquitoes mate and things like that. They they're, they're looking at uh, uh, what their genes are and and what uh, yeah. how they compare to other genes and <laughs> and uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but. Uh, uh, I, th I think biology in general is, is a lost art. Uh, I consider myself a biologist. Uh, you know, I'm still interested in frogs and toads and things like that. Sure. We understand uh, that because I'm, but, I'm but, in your but camp. The, yeah, but the whole biology of business of, of, of medical entomology, I think uh, the agricultural entomologists are still a little more... Uh, Hmm. Traditional, but the medical entomologists have all gone molecular. That, sure. We we have a uh, uh, the Anopheles gambii genome. We have the Aedes aegypti genome. We have the genomes of our parasites now. And so when uh, we we have fifty postdoctoral fellows in our lab, and when they give up to get, uh, give their talks, they still put up a life cycle. But I've been to, <laughs> I, I, I've That's been just for to, you, Bob. <laughs> I, I've been to so many seminars where the person gets up and puts up a gel. I mean, that's his, orga that's his organism. It's a gel. That's right. <laughs> and uh, Or it's a sequence. Yeah. It's a sign uh, of the times, Bob. Sign of the times. Yeah. Well, when we, uh, my lab, give seminars, we still put up a life cycle because it helps to fix you on what your virus is doing. Right. Yes. Here's how it infects a cell and or or a host and what it does inside. I think I mean, it's very just useful. yesterday. Yesterday, I gave the West Nile virus lecture in Vince's course on the downtown campus, and I started with a life cycle of the sure. mosquitoes, and based it all on the things you told me, Bob. I swear to God, <laughs> I didn't I didn't go beyond my knowledge base because I didn't have much time anyway. Mm. But it didn't take much more time than that anyway, and I would have run out of knowledge. But, but well. 
Dixon and I have different views of West Nile, and I think my view is is prevailing more than his. Uh, I, I think Dixon started out with the chicken little view, and I felt that 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 it wouldn't be so bad after a few years. And if you look at uh, uh, West Nile now, it's an endemic disease in the United States. Correct. Uh, it's from one state to the other, and it waxes and wanes across the continent every year. It, uh, it, it's, it's interesting to compare the state one by one over the, the past uh, 10 or so years and how it, it peaked uh, probably about five years, four years after it first appeared. Right. But now it's it's stabilized. Uh, you don't hear about uh, dead crows. Uh, I was uh, walking uh, the dog the other morning, and I was taken by the number of blue jays yes. that I heard in the neighborhood. Interesting. And a few years ago, you didn't hear blue jays. They're all gone. You don't think that this could have selected for the resistance strain of blue jay, do you? <laughs> I don't know where the, res- where, where the accommodation took place. But there was an accommodation. Uh, the, uh, whether the, the virulence of... <laughs> Yeah, the virulence has changed, actually. It has changed. So there's certainly selection of blue jays. It's like the rabbits in Australia. Maybe, yeah. Uh, Dixon feels that the virus spread across the United States via car travel, either in the trunk or being whooshed along by the breezes, right? Yeah. What do you think about that hypothesis? I I think birds move uh, more effectively with the virus in them than do the... uh, the uh, cars, mm-hmm. uh, but that's that's something that, that that would be difficult to prove one way or another. Yeah, but somebody, that it, somebody released a genetically marked mosquito species two years ago and followed it across the country. It, it hop skipped and jumped all the way out to California. Yeah. Well, the so-called P element in Drosophila, I forget where it started, but it's everywhere in the world now. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it didn't didn't do it in the back of uh, no. pickup trucks. No, no, and then, certainly not. Certainly uh, not. So, we have a uh, lot to the, learn. We have a lot to learn from nature. Yeah, gene gene flow is is a rather remarkable. Yeah, you know, one one of my lines of research is the perfect mosquito. Perfect in what sense? Uh, that it does everything that mosquitoes were born to do, mm-hmm. carrying disease not being one of them, and so that it still feeds on you at night and bothers you and wakes you up and all that, but can't transmit the malaria parasite. I see. And you do this by finding out why some mosquitoes don't get infected and why others do, hopefully finding that it's a simple genetic mechanism and then mm. uh, making a transfected mosquito. Mm-hmm. Now, we've transfected a mosquito, except it was with a, 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 a gene for neomycin resistance right. so that uh, neomycin kills mosquito larvae, but it doesn't kill our mosquito larvae. <laughs> uh, Tony and, James did that too, though, with green fluorescent I, protein, didn't he? Yeah, he did that years later with Aedes aegypti, but I, right. you know, when we did ours much earlier, uh, and we did it in Anopheles gambi, which is the primary malaria uh, vector. Right. Uh, so that it, it can be done, and there are a lot of there's a renewed interest in that whole line of research now because, uh, in theory. Uh, you could then alter the capacity of a population to transmit the malaria parasite. Sure. The problem is that there are at least 200 species of mosquitoes uh, <laughs> that are uh, involved in the transmission of malaria around the world. Everyone has its own habits and its own uh, genetic makeup. Uh, and even within species, uh, within Anopheles gambi, we know four or five uh forms of Anopheles gambi, which are not separate species at this point, but they're probably genetically uh, uh, isolated, right. and uh, they're all transmitting at the same time or at different times in the same uh, uh, system, okay. and uh, to render one refractory might not have any effect on the others. So uh, yeah. it, it, these are not simple procedures. And you go to Bali a lot, so aren't there three different transmission seasons over there? Don't you have a... Intermittent, uh, a constant transmission, and uh, well, seasonal? it depends on where you are. Exactly. The further north you get, it becomes very rain dependent. So uh-huh. that from the middle of the country north into the Sahara, it's 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 rain dependent. So it's a Sahelian type, uh, mm-hmm. uh, starting in May and ending in October. You right. get further down, and, and you you go into the the Guinea savanna, and then into uh, uh, near rainforest, and then you have year-round transmission, as Indeed. you have in in much of Central Africa. Are you, uh, are you still in collaboration with Dr. Kaluzzi? Uh Mario is not well. Uh-oh. 
Uh, he's suffering from Parkinson's. Oh, Maybe you're not supposed to say that on the, but, uh, and so he, uh, we still have contact with him, but he's, he's not actively oh, uh, doing much work. Sorry to hear that. So Bob, have you released any modified mosquitoes yet? No. Cause you, I don't, you probably have heard that there have been a few releases to try and control dengue. Yeah. And one of them, I think, was putting Wolbachia into mosquitoes and releasing them. You know about that? Yes. Well, you know, the Wolbachia story, uh, Wolbachia pipientis, is named after Culex pipiens. Uh huh. Because it was first, uh, described probably back in the late 50s by a German by the name of Hans Lavin. And Lavin went so far as to uh, uh, work out this whole system of uh, cytoplasmic incompatibility in the mosquito with, mm-hmm. with the Wolbachia. And then uh, actually did some releases back, I think, in the uh, 60s in, uh, in India. Uh, the problem is that the, uh, uh, the locals got riled up uh, <laughs> and they burnt the trucks. Really? Yes. Uh, what, what was happening? There was a lot of political unrest in the area, and there uh, they started talking about this being a uh, capitalist plot to uh, infect the people in the neighborhood, and they got all scared. Uh, that was at the same time. The man who works for me in Mali is a fellow by the name of Dick Sakai, and he's a Hawaiian American, Japanese American from Hawaii. And he was accused around that time on the front page of his vestia of producing uh, uh, dengue-infected uh, Aedes aegypti and shipping them via the CIA to be dumped over Cuba. And those things were believed at that time. So, uh, so, yeah. so do you think the Wolbachia put insertion into dengue mosquitoes is, is going to be effective? Or? I don't know. I think it's too early to tell. Yeah. Uh, I think all these insertions are problematic because we don't know what it does to the uh, the life of the mosquito. Are yes. there uh, finite little negatives that come from it that uh, may right. not allow it to uh, compete with with the natives there? Yeah. I mean, this is this is the problem with any of the gene introductions. Uh, we hope that they're absolutely neutral or, in fact, positive in their effects. Sure. Uh, I mean, in theory, if a mosquito doesn't get infected with malaria, it should have uh, a genetic advantage. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't uh, because it's mosquitoes. It's a healthier mosquito. <laughs> it's a healthier mosquito. We don't we don't know that they uh, uh, are are ill. But there is damage to their their gut cells and things like that. Sure. Uh, one a study done by uh, uh, an army scientist several years ago, I think, demonstrated that mosquitoes that were infected had reduced uh, flight range. Right. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, he is now a multimillionaire. <laughs> He he is the, 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 the CEO or... <laughs> of uh, no the CEO of a major biotech company. <laughs> Not because of that observation, though, right? Uh, no, because later in his career, the army put him in charge of vaccine programs. I see. And then when he retired, he started his own company. There you go. So when when you modify mosquitoes to try and reduce malaria transmission, what how do you modify them? Oh, we did it very uh, crudely. We were using the old Drosophila P element. Uh, Technology mm-hmm. from Spradling and Rubin, where we literally injected the DNA into individual eggs. Okay. And then uh, the eggs would hatch. And since we were dealing, our, our, what we were trying to introduce was the gene for neomycin resistance. What we would then do is treat all the larvae with neomycin, and those that lived mm-hmm. uh, would uh, presumably have the gene expressing itself, and in fact it did. It inserted itself at a, tel- at a telomere, and with in situ hybridization, you could very nicely make the tip of the telomere glow, uh, showing the presence of the gene. So that was a proof of concept? That was a proof of concept. I think you can have to come up with things like uh, electroporation or mm-hmm. uh, other other mechanisms to do uh, mass uh, 
Right. So have you gotten any uh, progress with regards to identifying the genes for resistance in mosquitoes that will not... There are a lot of groups working on that right now uh, and with greater or lesser effect. Uh, you know, the irony of the whole business is that I mentioned that there are perhaps uh, 200 species of anophelines that transmit malaria, right. but there, there are thousands of species of anophelines. Now, some of them don't get infected because they don't feed on humans, and right. some don't live long enough. They're all different reasons, or they're right. in, in the wrong climates. Yeah. Uh, but uh, someone in our group uh, is looking at the question of why Culex doesn't get infected with malaria, uh, a human malaria, because uh, the majority of mosquitoes that feed on you at night in the tropics and the majority of mosquitoes that are feeding on people with malaria in the tropics are Culex. Uh, the anophelines are, are, are a mi rather minor part of the mosquito population when it comes to total numbers feeding it on people. Yet, Culex never gets infected. Yet, Culex does get infected with other malarias. So, many of the bird malarias are transmitted by Culex. So, there's nothing intrinsically defective in the Culex mosquito. Uh, for the support of a malaria parasite, but it, human malaria parasites don't. Can so you, we, Bob, can you artificially inject them with the stages from Anopheles oh, mosquitoes oh, oh, you could, and you then could, get them to grow inside the Culex? No, no. They won't. Been able to get that happen. Okay. So they've on, tried the other hand, you, on the other hand, you can take certain stages of the malaria parasite and inject them into male mosquitoes, male Anopheles, uh -huh. and they'll grow. So they'll grow in males. Interesting. So is your... Interest. Oh, we lost them. I think we did. I'll get a dial them back. <laughs> Hello? Hello. Indeed. Sorry about that. I ran out of money. <laughs> I, heard, I heard you dropping the, the, the dimes in the machine. <laughs> <laughs> His Skype account ran out of money. Uh, I, can't I, was that. On my, I was on my wrong Skype account. So I loaned him a quarter, so yeah, talk had, fast. <laughs> you had to keep putting... Uh, Quarters in. How funny. What were we saying? We were saying about uh, man manipulating mosquito mosquitoes and why Culex doesn't is get more... infected. Right. Right. If, we, if we could find out why Culex, which would seem to be a very simple thing, uh, oh. perhaps we could introduce this uh, characteristic into anophelines and get them. Right. Well, the other question then is, do bird malarias that are culicine driven infect anopheline mosquitoes? Some of them. Okay. Uh they're less non-permissive. Right? Yeah, but but for example, with Plasmodium gallinaceum, the chicken malaria, which we do a lot of work on, right. uh, uh, we nicely transmit it in the laboratory with Aedes aegypti. It will not go into uh, Culex pipiens. How about Lefuri? At all. So this is a bird malaria. Yeah, how about Lefuri in ducks? Uh, since nobody's had gametocytes in Lefuri since it was first uh, isolated from the fire pheasant, uh, firebag pheasant, uh, 50 years ago, uh, we can't oh, yeah. answer that question. We don't know what, you know, because Traeger used vectors. to work on that all the time. Ah, so, but it was blood transmission. Yeah, no, no, exactly right. I often wondered why he wasn't using mosquitoes, and that's the answer. Yeah, it never worked. Isn't that interesting? Now, you did some work. I know you, you did some work earlier on in your career at NIH to look at the uh, reason why gametocytes are produced and using that as a vaccine. Well, not why they're produced, but to develop a vaccine against the sexual stages of the malaria parasite. Sure. Uh, so this is the entomologist vaccine. I'm right. not worried about people. I'm worried about sick mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, you can immunize the vertebrate host, uh, first with chickens and then with monkeys, uh, using the monkey malaria, with the sexual stages of the malaria parasite. Okay. The, uh, the vertebrate host produces antibody to the gametocytes. Right. Uh, actually, to the you don't immunize with gametocytes; you immunize yeah, with gametes. gametes. Sure. Uh, the gametes do not appear in the vertebrate circulation. They don't right. appear right. until they get into the gut of the vector. So, uh, if you immunize with immunize you with gametes, yep. you have antibodies against gametes. When you get a malaria infection, the mosquito feeds on you. It in, it ingests everything in the blood meal, including gametocytes and antibody. Right. In the gut, the, gamete, the gametes first appear, they run into 
anti-gamete antibodies. They are locked up in the gut of the mosquito. Fertilization does not take place. The mosquito does not be, become infected. And then you have what is called transmission blocking immunity. Right. Uh, that sort of uh, waxed and waned for a while because, uh, the general concept is, is altruistic in that it doesn't protect the person being immunized. Yeah. It uh, protects people around them. Uh, it's now, uh, has a new life and, and a number of major groups and the Gates Foundation are, are funding it, uh, with the, uh, for two reasons. One, under certain conditions, it could be a very effective vaccine if you have a low level of transmission. Mm -hmm. But secondly, if you have a blood stage vaccine or a sporozoid vaccine and you mix a transmission blocking component, then the likelihood of a breakthrough in the, in, in, in the more pathology causing form, uh, would be stopped by the transmission blocking, blockage. Right. right. So that's that's uh, gotten a lot more play, and there's a lot more interest sure. in it now. So it how realistic ago. is it for anyone to think about developing a vaccine for humans against malaria? I mean, really, honestly, with all the money we've spent on this and all the time, I know that uh, Jeffrey Target was very disappointed over 20 years of research without anything to show for it, the way he put it, but that wasn't true, of course, but that is the way he stated it. And so now we're faced with the Stephen Hoffman approach of, absolute intensive labor, you know, getting out all these irradiated sporozoites to make sure that they have enough to, to immunize. Is that, is that the next step for you guys or what's going on there? Uh, I think that subunit vaccines are probably going to be what ends up uh, being effective. Uh, you have to have the right antigen and then you have to have the right adjuvant. So the nuisance wax thought still, they had the right ad antigen, right? And you actually collaborated with them for a while. Well, they have they have the art. What is it? The RTTSS uh, that they work. They're working with uh, Smith Klein, and uh, every time they reconstruct it and use a better adjuvant, it becomes more effective. Got it. Uh, I think that uh, the problem is so serious that to become discouraged even after 20 years of uh mm. of work is is mm -hmm. not fair. Mm -hmm. Uh I mean I remember 30 years ago uh headlines and papers of vaccine in 5 years of vaccine yeah. in 5 That's years right. and people right. people have been promising it uh uh the people who promise are long gone uh <laughs> Uh, since, right. since we don't want lawsuits, we won't mention any names, but, uh, <laughs> one could sit in, in, in private and, and talk about individuals, uh, usually sure. very arrogant individuals Indeed. who made their promises and then nothing came of it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but things are getting better and we're learning more about the, uh, molecular biology of these, uh, sure. creatures and, and sure. their regular biology and things like that. So okay. that, uh, so what's the most interesting aspect of all of this for you right now in your life? Well, in fact, what I've, my life has now become uh, concerned with helping others develop new programs to do the work that I'm probably not going to ever do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I get a great deal of joy out of setting up labs and raising money to build labs and, and okay. uh, facilities and get people trained and things like that. So uh, yeah. working very hard, uh, working with our, our Malian collaborators, our Cambodian collaborators, and the people here of, of placing young people out in the field and, and giving them the opportunity to, to go from uh, sure. bench to the field, uh, which is something that uh, People are starting to realize the importance of, but it's very expensive. Yeah, that's uh, true. Both to have the infrastructure uh, overseas to do these things, and then to send uh, somebody over there. I mean, we uh, two three years ago we were spending fifteen hundred dollars for a ticket that's now costing us six thousand dollars. I know, uh, and uh, it's 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 not easy. Uh, but once you start getting into administration, you don't go to the lab bench anymore. No. It, it can't be done. Where is the laboratory in Cambodia, Bob? It's in, uh, well, we have our main lab in Phnom Penh okay. at the National Malaria Center, but we have uh, a, a laboratory in Thamar Da, which is down on the uh, Thai-Cambodian border where they hit the ocean, ah. uh, and it's an area where the, the, on the sides of the roads are all these mine signs. It's it's Khmer Rouge country from the old days, and wow. and we deal with people who work Khmer Rouge. 
sure. and live, live out there. And then we have, uh, we started, last year we started a new lab in Arachidakiri, which is up around uh, the corner of uh, Cambodia that borders on Laos to the north and uh, <laughs> Vietnam uh, to the east. And now we're starting a, a new lab this year uh, up closer to the Burmese border. If you ever get one started in Siem Reap, uh, call me up and I'll be glad to go over there and help you on that one. Uh, there are, there are, for, for the tourists, there are more five, what they call five star, and, then, and certainly yeah, that's right. uh, amount of five star hotels in Siem Reap than anywhere else in the world. That's true. Uh, for sixty dollars a night. I know. So the, you, these uh, remote sites that so the NIH helps to set them up, but they are staffed by local scientists. Yes, they're staffed by local scientists, and, and but, we usually send uh, one or two people out there. Uh, for the transmission season, but mm -hmm. there's a permanent staff uh, out there year-round, and these are all Cambodians, or in Mali, they're Malians. And they do research, or they... They do research. We don't do... Uh, the NIH is not involved in control programs. Okay. Uh, we, if we have people in, involved uh, in clinical research, uh, we take care of the people in the village, but it's not a... Uh, you know, someone comes in sick, you treat them. Mm -hmm. Right, sure. But it's but we don't go out and distribute drugs just on the uh, basis of, of trying to prevent malaria or bed nets or any of those things. Right, it's not not our goal. So I notice on the staff list that in Mali that you have on your website that yeah. these are, these are individuals that don't have PhDs. Well, we have actually a fair number of people with PhDs. Mm -hmm. Uh, and interestingly, the people we've trained either in Europe or the United States, we normally take people with either an MD, a PhD, or a uh, PharmD. They do a lot of, they give a lot of PharmDs. Uh, uh, more drugstores than there are physicians in the country, I think. But, uh, no, we've had four people get PhDs at Tulane. Uh, a couple have gotten PhDs at uh, the University of Maryland. Two have gotten PhDs at Notre Dame. Uh, we just had, uh, one get a PhD at London School, one at Oxford. Uh, so yeah, we've got people with uh, PhDs uh, that are on top of their MDs or their local uh, doctorates. So I, I guess I'm interested in how is are they enthusiastic there to do this work? Can you have you have no trouble recruiting people to do this? Well, uh, Mali is probably uh, in a strange position. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. On the other hand, it's not tribalistic and it's not uh, burned by uh, the colonial uh, legacy. Mm -hmm. Even though it was a French colony, the French never paid much attention to it. Uh, so they don't have a lot of resentment towards Westerners. Mm -hmm. uh, and virtually everybody we've trained has come back. Uh, it's not like a lot of the other countries where you get a guy a PhD and the next thing, you know, he's teaching a college in uh, Pennsylvania or something yeah, like yeah, that. Sure. Uh, so we've had uh, a very high rate of return. All, virtually nobody's backed out. Right. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, so we've got a very good staff and, and we've got also got a broad ranging program out there. I started it as a malaria program, but about 10 years ago, I, uh, was asked by the NIH to set up an HIV program, so we've got a big HIV TB research program there, mm -hmm. and uh, we've got a big vaccine testing program out there. Uh, do a lot of immunology, so it's 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 a. We probably have a about uh, oh right now about uh, eighty uh, Malians on full payroll. I notice in one of these photos, there's a camera, two cameras for filming. Mosquito swarms in 3D <laughs> at night. What do you do with at that? At night. <laughs> at night. Well, we're in fact working with with uh, engineers at the University of Maryland, and they can I by slowing this down, you can then put a tag on a mosquito, an electronic marker on it, <laughs> and then follow that one mosquito into the swarm. <laughs> now, remember, the swarms are all males. And the females are attracted to the swarm. They go in, and then suddenly they'll drop out of the swarm on copula with the male. Uh, but it appears that they have uh, a bit of male selection capacity. Huh. There's not much time involved there. But these females are going in, and they're saying, I want you, but not you. They don't all look alike. <laughs> well, they, the or smell all, alike or sound alike. <laughs> they all sound alike and smell alike and, 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 and move about. Uh, 
I did so, I did something similar for my uh, nothing sophisticated like that because I was thinking about it this morning. My doctoral dissertation was on mating behavior uh, of Aedes aegypti, and I would set up a chamber where, with a microscope, I could watch a tethered female interacting with males, and then I could watch her uh, copulate and things like that. Uh, but uh, we had no, di- you know, we had no digital cameras. Sure. I tried yeah. to <laughs> film once with with a uh, a, uh, a a Bolex uh, a movie camera. Uh, Movie yeah. camera, and and I, I I got my parallax wrong because you <laughs> you, you couldn't uh, shoot through the lens, and and I I had my wiggling pin, but I didn't have my female there, <laughs> and so I I but now it would be a snap with all these uh, digital cameras. Sure, you'd have real time uh, viewing, and then be able to study it again and again and again. Oh, you might be able to revisit that stuff then, Bob. Yeah, I didn't know they went in swarms. Well, uh, the Anopheline swarm, as do the Culex. So you have these male swarms. Females are attracted to the swarm. They fly into the swarm. They're inseminated. Then they go off and take their blood meal, and, and life goes on. Oh. So you shouldn't be afraid of the swarm. So the swarm is for mating. The swarm is for mating. <clears throat> do we have swarms here in the U.S.? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I never see I never see them, but well, but but go to the woods. I mean, a lot of the diptera swarm. So uh-huh. you'll see like a little cloud of uh, very tiny uh, uh, flies flying around together. It's usually a male swarm. Mm-hmm. Uh, my old professor Craig uh, would go out there, and uh, he was a large individual, uh, uh, and he would hum at a certain frequency, and the swarm <laughs> would would move towards him. Huh. <laughs> uh, I've seen clouds. Is that the same thing? Yeah. We went to we were in Oregon yeah, last clouds. summer and we were passing through an irrigated area of farmland oh, and yes. there were clouds. Oh yeah. Hundreds and hundreds oh, of yeah. clouds of I don't know what they were, but huh. Well, that's not necessarily don't mating. Sometimes get it's out of ma- your car. <laughs> they're ma- mass emergence. Yeah. 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 Uh, I've never seen anything like it and they were we drove through them and the the car was completely The worst splattered. I ever saw was in Wyoming. The worst, because I, you know, Bob knows I trout fish, and they they told me to put a bandana over my face, yeah. goo this this blue gel all over myself, what had deed in, I'm sure, and keep everything nice and tight. When you get to the river, you're going to be fine, but getting to the river is a big challenge, and I didn't believe them. It was there were irrigation ditches all over this place, and the, I'd never seen so many mosquitoes, Bob. I'm not kidding. Are you are you a fisherman, Bob? Oh, oh I, I was as a youth, and I still take my grandsons fishing. I have six oh, grand. Man. Good man. I have six grandsons. Right. Excellent. So I take them out of, uh, and now I don't have to buy a license. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That is right. Mm-hmm. I've been grandfathered in, as it were. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know, Dixon, you were from Ohio, and uh, well, the Lake Erie well. yeah. swarms of mayflies oh, are, yeah, sure. are legendary. You got it. They used to close the bridges down when they hatched out. Really? They, they, yeah, they had cars that slid off the bridge into the into the lake. Wow! Yeah, they, These they are, all come out at the same time. Hexagenia. And, and, big in fact, they mate almost immediately and lay their eggs, and they're gone. Exactly. Wow! That's why. That's they're why called, they're called ephemeroptera. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yep, and I love that. Listening to Bob lecture to the medical students here, how many years do you think you did that, Bob? More than twenty. More than 20. It was never two the same, by the way. Mm-hmm. And they were always fascinating, and they always held the students' interest. Although, you must admit, Bob, they were more interested in the live stuff you brought. <laughs> I mean, they were freaked out by the fact that you could see a live tick, a live mosquito, a live... What else did you bring? Reduva dead bugs. bugs. I bought dead, dead bugs. bugs. Yes, that's how they got here. No wonder. <laughs> we're the epicenter for them now. <laughs> it's all your fault. <laughs> no, we won't say that. We won't say well, that. Well, you know... The bed bugs are, are one uh, representative medical entomology that's a blood feeder. And what's remarkable about bed bugs, and we all, all know about bed bugs now because of this resurgence, is that they transmit no diseases. Exactly. They've, they've been uh, suggested exactly. a, with all kinds of uh, uh, things, uh, but they've never been shown to transmit any disease. Exactly. Isn't that true uh, for scabies as well? Yeah, but they're less a blood feeder than a tissue feeder. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and there, are, you know, there are there are other. All the maggots don't transmit diseases. Chiggers, chiggers do though. Uh, chiggers do. They transmit uh, 
Uh, Su- scrub typhus. And Tsutsukumuchi. Well, Tsutsukumuchi fever is scrub typhus. No. <laughs> we like to use the formal words around here, Bob. We're microbiologists. Right. <laughs> and that, that used to be called Rickettsia akamushi, but I think they've changed the, uh, uh-huh. the name. Uh-huh. Why do we have a resurgence of bed bugs? Uh, it's a good question. There, there's no particular rhyme or reason for it. Uh, they do travel well. People travel a lot. But this mm-hmm. is all in the last 10 years that uh, the bed bugs have appeared all over the world. Uh, they're, they're, they're big in college dorms. They're big uh, right. in some of the best hotels. They, uh, That's right. And whenever we go somewhere, my wife is always looking at the, uh, oh. the, the if you look at the bed, um, <clears throat> the thing that hangs around it. Uh, the coverlet? Coverlet. You can see, she said you can see the black spots. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a famous old movie. I remember it, uh, called The L Shaped Room with oh. Leslie Caron. And then she's living in this sort of a flea bag apartment building. And she tells her next door neighbor, who's a uh, this black guy, that she's got these, um, she's something's biting her at night. And he says, well, this is the way we do it. So he takes a bar of soap from, from the bathroom. And you know how one side of the bar of soap gets all squishy with uh, sure. soap? Uh, and sure. he says, now come out of the room, turn off the lights. Turns off the lights. Then they rush into the room and he takes the soap and he taps her bed all over the place. Uh, and then in the, in the sticky, gooey soap, are the bed bugs that have come out onto the bed that she'd been in a little God. while before and was warm and uh, they had come out of their cracks and hiding places to nice. take their blood meals. Yuck. Nice. <laughs> so uh, tell us about some of the other projects that are ongoing at uh, NIH that uh, is in the Laboratory of Parasitology. The entomological or in general? Well, I think in general, but you have a big emphasis on malaria. I know that. So, yeah. Well, we have a big malaria program, obviously, uh, but uh, ha- half our lab is actually entomology. And uh, one of the mm. interesting characters in our group is uh, Jose Ribeiro, who works on insect saliva. And a former student of his is now tenured. That's uh, Jesus Valenzuela. And he is producing uh, vaccines for leishmaniasis based on the sandfly vector saliva. Excellent. Because the saliva uh, apparently uh, has a, a major effect on the macrophages that sure. these parasites go into. And by immunizing, you can prevent this from taking. Now, he's getting support from uh, a French pharmaceutical company that specializes in uh, veterinary vaccines. Oh, yeah. Uh, because leishmaniasis, uh, is a dog parasite also. And we have it here, don't we? And, and, uh, it's, when it comes to where the money is, there's a lot more money <laughs> in, in veterinary, uh, uh, medicines than there is in human medicine. Right. Uh, I think ivermectin being the best example, uh, uh, uh. a drug developed for, um, uh, animal worms is now uh, given free by Merck to uh, WHO for uh, oncocerciasis control. Indeed. But uh, ivermectin is a wonder drug. Mm. Uh, it's the drug of choice for scabies. Yep. It's great for head lice. Yep. It'll, uh, it, who knows, it might work against bed bugs. <laughs> it knocks out strongyloides, too. It does yeah. a pretty good job against hookworm. Yeah, you could go on and on. You're absolutely right. Fascinating. So yeah, so you guys, you don't talk about typhus, though, do you? Well, not in this show, we yeah, don't. No. But I Typh- think t- typhus is one of my favorites, only because it's, it's a, you know, the the louse is 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 such an interesting character. Well, Here, here's an insect that doesn't fly. Tell us about it. Sure. Uh, well, you know, we've got three species of lice on the human body. Okay. We've got the uh, head louse, body louse, and the uh, the crab louse and the pubic louse. Uh, the head lice live on the heads. And uh, at Columbia, you would ask the uh, second year class, how many of you have had head lice? And uh, <laughs> uh, about, I'd say about two thirds of the, uh, yeah. the females would raise their hands. The guys almost never have had it, <laughs> but sometimes they do. Uh, what's interesting is that none of the uh, Afro Americans have had head lice. Uh-huh. Right. Re- reason being that, that the American head louse is a European variety and its its claws fit best around uh, European hair. There are hmm. pl- plenty of head lice in Africa, 
but their the diameter of their claws is slightly different because of the characteristics of of African hair. It's never been introduced into the United States, so right. we've, we've got head lice. Body lice, of course, are on the, don't live on the body; they live in your clothes. So that if you routinely change your underwear and and and, and take good baths and things like that, body lice don't take off. But uh, in street people and in uh, uh, prison of war camps and in the military and things like that, uh, uh, body lice can become very very large populations, and of sure. course that's the vector of typhus. Right. Uh, so the body louse carries typhus. Yes. Not the head louse or the crab louse. The head louse can, but usually doesn't. The crab louse has is, is never been implicated as a potential vector. Isn't that what did in Napoleon's army? Well, uh, Napoleon started his campaign on the Neiman River in Poland. Uh, and he put together an army of 600,000 from countries all over Europe that were allied with him. Uh, and as, as one commentator remarked that while they were waiting on the banks of the Neiman, the uh, Polish peasants very happily shared their lice and their typhus with the <laughs> Napoleon's army. Uh, there were 90,000 soldiers left of the 600,000 when they reached Moscow. Exactly. Uh, 300,000 died of typhus and dysentery. Amazing. About 100,000 died in uh, combat. And then they started their retreat, which was even worse, uh, yes. because it was now winter. Uh, 20,000 made it back to Paris. Most of these had epidemic typhus and frostbite. Uh, only 3,000 of the original 600,000 survived the whole campaign. That's amazing. Uh, in 1813, Napoleon raised a new army of, of a half million, almost immediately. Uh more than 200,000 of those died of typhus, and the rest died of Waterloo. Wow. Bob, wow. Ha Bob have you read Rat's Lice in History? Oh, yes. I, I probably read, the, read that in, in high school, you know, and then many times thereafter. He reviewed it. Yeah. <laughs> this, because what you're saying reminds me of it, because he talks yeah, a lot about sure. the, the war sure. and the effect yeah. of it. In fact, one of my favorite um, design people is this guy, Edward Tuft, uh, which we've mentioned on several other shows. And he has a wonderful graph it's not even a graph. It's a map of of, of Napoleon's campaign. And well, that's Menard. Yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. It, it, we'll, we're going to put it up online because you've mentioned it. It's in it. Vi visual explanations? Uh, no, it's in it's, Another book. I'll, I'll get it for us after the show. But uh, So what else would you like us to know about lice? Well, you know, if, if go into the 20th century during the First War, uh, more than uh, – 200,000 Serbian troops died in 1914, right. including 400 physicians. Wow. Uh, in, in Russia during the first war, there are 25 million cases of typhus with uh, more than 3 million deaths. So, uh, you know, uh, there were epidemics during the Second World War in Japan. Right. Uh, I think on one of your lectures, I heard you talking about uh, using body dusting for uh, yes. with DDT, yes. and that stopped the epidemic in Naples in That's 1943 exactly. during exactly. the winter. They were exactly. expecting an enormous typhus epidemic. Uh, Naples had been occupied and yep. cut off, and, and in 1943 they were expecting uh, disaster because they had no way of really treating uh, very effectively the typhus. So, uh, uh, although there was a vaccine. Uh, huh. Uh, but in Naples, they used DDT. They stopped it cold. Mm -hmm. You know the history of the... Uh, so now, now this is coming from my Polish lecture. Go on, keep going. You're on a roll. Uh, <laughs> the, the first typhus vaccine, it's not medical entomology, but was done by a, an Austrian-born Polish-educated physician by the name of Stefan Weigel. And what he did is he uh, would dissect out uh, the guts of infected lice uh, with the rickettsii, and then attenuate them, and he made a vaccine. How did he now, attenuate them? I didn't. I don't know how he attenuated them. I okay. to find that out. Okay. Uh, but uh, what's to to the uh, microbiologist in the in the group? Uh, what's one of the characteristics of of rickettsii in the lab? Mm, they need to grow inside no, they, something they, else. They right? they easily aerosolize. They aerosolize. And so the making of his vaccine was very dangerous. Uh, yeah. But he was he was in the early stages of it, and his Polish assistant, a young physician, thought it looked good, so he tried it out on his wife, mm. and it didn't kill his mm. wife. And, and so they had a vaccine, but it was very, very dangerous to the people working in the factories. Uh, around the same time, 
Cox working at the Rocky Mountain Laboratory of my institute, the NIAID, uh, was able to grow it in uh, chick embryos. Huh. And that was a much safer methodology, and, I th- uh, and they, they produced the vaccine very effectively uh, in the early stages, but they weren't making a lot of it right. during the Second World War. This uh, typhus wow. is a rickettsia, yes. which, which is a bacterium, right? Sort yes. of. And it's an obligate parasite. That's true. It's intracellular. It must grow inside of yeah. eukaryotic cells, is that right? Yes, and, and, and it grows uh, in the cells of the gut of the... Uh, of the louse. Now, the louse does not inject it. You know, we always think of mosquitoes as being flying syringes. Right. Uh, the louse, much like the kissing bug, defecates wow. uh, infected feces around the wound, and then the next morning you wake up scratching, and and you scratch the feces into the wound. Got it. Do so we have Do we have typhus in the U.S. still? Uh, we have uh, typhus in flying squirrels. Hmm. Uh, so you can uh, you can find it in the flying squirrels. But we don't get we don't, don't acquire uh, it from them. No, probably not. But we have uh, other rickettsia diseases in the United States. Oh yeah, we have well, uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, probably most famous among them. Yep, yep. Uh, but well, is human typhus elsewhere in the world? Sure. Uh, yes. It's it's an endemic, and there's an epidemic typhus too, which is uh, uh-huh. flea-borne. Mm-hmm. Ah. Or no, uh, uh, Rickettsia proachecai is epidemic typhus. We have right. an endemic typhus, right. which is another Rickettsia. I think it's Rickettsia rickettsii, yes. and that's transmitted by fleas, yes. and that's very common in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Uh, frequently. Uh, mistakenly diagnosed as typhoid. Uh, so how would you treat typhoid? Use antibiotics. Antibiotics. And what do antibiotics do to rickettsii? I guess they kill them, too. It kills them, too. So you never know. That's right. Uh, you may misdiagnose, but you correctly treat. So it, uh, huh. uh, these things Fantastic. don't get reported too often. Amazing. Uh, well... Bob, we could go on for hours, but we, we have could. to stop. Yeah. We, we should <laughs> have to let Bob And the go. reason why we have to stop is because we've used up all your time, too. But would you ever agree to come back on? Sure. We, we, you know, we haven't even touched uh, arboviruses. That's we right. haven't talked about the details of, of, of malaria or a lot That's of right. other diseases. And we haven't talked about maggots, <laughs> the wonderful, <laughs> the wonderful right. maggots the and, and my maggot. That's right. That's right. And brown recluse spiders. Oh, we have lots to talk about. It's so much fun. It's Sorry. it's yucky stuff, basically, but everybody oh. loves it. You know, we're, we're we're drawn to it like a moth to the flame. <laughs> uh, Bob, usually on TWIP, we also get emails from listeners, and I don't want to hold you for all of them, but I do want you to listen to one because it's from someone at Notre Dame. Oh. And this is a letter we received from Janine, who writes, I was a fellow graduate student at Notre Dame graduating in 1970. I remember your discussions on parasites in the break room with pleasure. <laughs> your, your name keeps popping up everywhere, most recently on TWIV. So I don't know if Bob knows Janine also. Janine doesn't ring any bells. I'll, I'll tell you her history. After following a postdoc at the University of Chicago, I had the good fortune to be hired as a grants manager by the Office of Naval Research in Chicago, where I lived. I was hired at the recommendation of Morris Pollard. Okay. Is that uh, your, the fellow from Notre Dame that you often talk about? That is correct. Yes, and, and he was my epi professor. Aha. Uh-huh. And I've probably seen him okay. within the last five years, and he remembers me. Oh, he's amazing. He's an amazing yeah. man. I went on to be transferred in 1982 to, the, to ONR headquarters in Arlington, where I still reside. I retired in 2002. My 30 years in government work proved to be a delightful continuation of graduate school, as I site visited hundreds of scientists most eager to discuss their research in areas ranging from shark behavior to fluid resuscitation of hemorrhage. I probably attended at least 200 conferences during my career as well. As a parting shot, so to speak, I fielded a battlefield hemorrhage treatment used by the Marines in Iraq. During most of my government career, I conducted part-time research in virology as a visiting professor at Loyola, uh, Uniformed Services University, University of Tennessee, and Washington State. 
My primary objective has been to understand how viruses make you sick, a field of minimal interest to virologists. I must conclude following many hostile letters from journal editors. <laughs> I've recently completed my work at WSU and plan to write a few more articles and then read books unrelated to virology. <laughs> Three of my most recent articles are attached. I am pleased that another student of Notre Dame has had a rewarding career. <laughs> oh, two more. You already listened to both of them well, right here. Now, and mine is, you know, I get paid by by the taxpayer to do what is my hobby. <laughs> That's so, a great way, uh, it. great way to put it. You know, and I, and I love I love coming to work. I have I, I, I look at that. the potential of uh, uh, of retirement with fear and trembling. You're gonna be fine. fine. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna be absolutely. You'll be more busy then than you are now. <laughs> I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. Well, Bob, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. Perhaps another time. Absolutely. It's great talking with you. Again. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. See. Thank you, Dixon. Shall we read a few emails while love we're to. here? Love to. The next one is from Chris, who writes, I am a doctor of pharmacy, and I have listened to all of your podcasts and have read many of your book suggestions, TWIV and TWIP. I thoroughly enjoy them and hang on every word of Dick's stories. I would also like to say a few things. First, may I point out the obvious flaw with your name, This Week in Parasitology, <laughs> and yet we don't have it weekly. I feel that we need more <laughs> shows just to catch up with all of Dick's anecdotes. You also mentioned the island of Ceylon changing to Madagascar, but in fact, no. it is now Sri Lanka. I, did we make another mistake? I guess. Yet another mistake. The USGS was formed in 1879 as a bill signed by President Rutherford Hayes, and I can't seem to find uh, anything in its history that relates to the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, as best as I can tell, thiabendazole is not available in the U.S. or Canada, and mabendazole oral is the current treatment for hookworm. I hope this helps keep them coming. It does help a great deal. P.S. Why not have a Twip Twiv app for your iPhone? All the contacts, emails, show notes, and shows and access to literature can be in one place. Just a thought. Okay, Chris, we have an app for listening. It's at microbeworld.org slash app. It doesn't do all of the things that you suggest. It is very expensive to have an app written, upwards of $20,000. So we can't afford that in our current state, but maybe someday we when, we, when we get some support, we'll try that. The next one is from Lars, who writes, this is my second mail to the TWIV TWIP team. Thanks for some more background information last time about the Plasmodium falciparum slash gorilla story. By now, I have listened to all TWIP podcasts more than once and have been able to listen to nearly all the TWIV podcasts. I can understand that with your schedule, it does not allow to have a TWIP and TWIV podcast every week, and I think in this field, it is better to have less podcasts, but the ones that are there go really into the subject. I think with a weekly but much shorter version, a lot of the public learning benefits are reduced, so it would be great to have these long TWIP and TWIV podcasts in the future <laughs> as well. I am sure you have heard about the Carter Center and its fight against guinea worm. Dixon yes. is nodding. Of course. We talked about it. It would be great to have a podcast about the guinea worm topic since it is said that this will be the second disease, the first parasitic disease to be eradicated and the first disease True. eradicated without the use of a vaccine. Yep. Readings from Germany. It will be eradicated soon. Yes. What is the guinea worm, Dixon? It's the one that you go into the step well to get the water, and there's a blister on your foot. Inside the blister is the head of the worm. It's a filarial worm, and it's laid her little larvae that swims mm -hmm. around in the blister fluid. The moment your foot goes under the water, the blister absorbs water. It swells and breaks open, releasing the larvae. Mm. Then as you scoop the water up in your bucket... The little copepods that eat the larvae of this parasite are in this. In other words, you're scooping up an entire ecosystem, basically. Wow. And on the way home with the water, the larvae that are eaten then invade the muscle tissue of the copepod and develop to the next stage. And then when you drink the water, of course, you will reacquire the infection. So they've overcome mm -hmm. this by simply closing the step wells and putting in pumps. But uh, there, are, there have been some problems in eliminating uh, the step wells because a lot of people like those step wells because they're sociological. Because when they go to talk to their friends, they can sit with their feet in the water and relax a little bit before they have to go back to work. 
So could there, we do an entire show on the guinea worm? We could, including its control. We could. All right. It wouldn't be wrong. All right. Well, we shall do it's, that. Its formal name is Dracunculus medinensis. Ah, I've seen that in your book. And it's the symbol for the caduceus, basically. Dracunculus. We talked about that a little bit. I'm not sure where we did, but I know that one of our podcasts has... Briefly, perhaps. That could be right. The next one is from Jim, our friend in Virginia. Okay, Jim. Dixon. He writes to Dixon. What a terrific, cohesive, and comprehensive approach to hookworms. Such a delicate handling of the political and social issues, too. You may receive some response from listeners upset about the Civil War and slavery and Southern lethargy, but hopefully it will be balanced by positive reactions. I just finished an article about a visit to Biloxi, Mississippi, in an 1865 edition of Harper's Weekly magazine that talked about the lethargy that infects not only locals but visitors, too. Yep. Referring more to the weather, I suppose, than parasites. <clears throat> Even in the 60s, while living in California, folks would refer to the much slower pace of life and speech in the South that supposedly derived from culture and weather. Interesting idea that parasite-derived group activity or more might lead to social changes that perpetuate it. Thanks for a terrific netcast. Looking forward to the rest of the story. It's nice. Well, you might get the rest next time because... Peter Hotez is scheduled to be our guest. And he talks about... He's the world's expert on hookworm. hookworm. Oh, definitely. He knows all about it. All right, let's do one more. David writes, Love the show. This delightful book has a section that is germane to your show, and you might want to quote a few lines and discuss. So let's see what we have here. Hmm. The Singular Beast, it's called... Jews, Christians, and the Pig by Claudine Fabre Vassas. Have you ever heard of this book? You know, if I say no, I'll be probably betraying my lack of memory cells, but uh, I, I vaguely remember hearing something about a book that discussed the uh, taboos of eating pig. Anyway, he says um, it details the occupation of a tongue examiner of pigs who would look for signs of parasite infection and sometimes cover it up. Uh -huh. Also, I have been a victim of Giardia three times as I was Oof. outdoor type of fellow who had a dog I traveled with extensively. Right. I got the classic symptoms each time, painful abdomen, often after eating foul-smelling stools that persisted, yeah. changes in stool consistency and color, and it lasts until some form of treatment. Round one, cured by fla flagell, a.k.a. Metron metronidazole. Like metronidazole. Round two, cured by wheat germ, and I mean cured, followed by flagell. Round three, cured by wheat germ alone. Some research is here. He sent us a link to a paper, which is entitled, Dixon, yes. Wheat Germ Supplement Reduces Cyst and Trophozoite Passage in People with Giardiasis. Isn't that interesting? And this is published in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, which you will admit is a well-respected It journal. is peer-reviewed and well-respected. There was a, When I was at Rockefeller, there was a guy there by the name of Shadler. And Shadler did experiments on wheat germ mm -hmm. and located in its compounds and chemistry when you break open the wheat germ and, and make a, an alcohol-soluble and a water-soluble fraction, there was a fraction... In, I forget which one it was in, uh, that produced a substance which actually prevented salmonellosis from developing in animals. And he called this substance passiferin. Mm -hmm. And there's a history of that. Passiferin research. A lot of people didn't buy it. and They thought maybe it was uh, an epi effect. And, uh, you know, it wasn't exactly as uh, ironclad a story as Shadler would have liked it to have been. But there certainly was something to the fact that wheat germ contained an antimicrobial agent. I see. Interesting. And uh, perhaps this is another expression of that same... Uh, it could be. ...series of family compounds, perhaps. Well, we will post a link to that. It would Thank be you. very important to look into this. Thank right? you, David. Yeah. And the last one is from Laura, who writes, I'm currently studying zoology at the university and starting a master's degree in molecular parasitology and vector biology in September. Cool. We just talked about a little ver we vector did. biology, we didn't we? We just did. We just did. I have recently seen a story on monsters inside me. Ah, yes. <laughs> it's on the Discovery <laughs> Channel. Yes. About a fireman who became infected with Balamuthia, 
Yes. An amoeba where there have only been a few cases in humans. Correct. Would you be able to tell us more about opportunistic amoeba? Well, I can say a few words about them because not a lot is known, but there's one called Naglaria fowleri. Is it in, is it in your it's book? It's in the soil. Yes, it is. It's there. And another one called Acanthamoeba castellani. Acanthamoeba castellani is infected by Mimi virus. You know it is. And it's also infected by... Sputnik. <laughs> yeah, it's no, that, it's the no, virophage of Mimi I know. Virus. I'm trying to think of the bacteria, though, that infects it. I think it's Listeria. Oh, that infects the canthamoeba, really? Yeah, that's right. Should we look it up? The cyst protects the bacteria from being harmed during periods of hot weather. And what does a canthamoeba do in people? Uh, well, it creates a keratitis in your eye. I see. If you are silly enough to take your uh, artificial lens and wash them in just straight tap water. Oh, my. Which is not filtered. Yeah, keratitis and even encephalitis. Yeah, yeah, it can so, get it can get into systemic regions of the body. It's as a well. very common soil um, protozoan. Very common. And how would you acquire it? Just by soil contaminated hands, dirty hands. Amoeba, actually, you can get catch this one by swimming in uh, heated fresh water. So during the summer months, when the water mm -hmm. levels go way up, yeah, uh, you can catch it that way. Oh, here you go, Negleria and Acanthamoeba. A nice CDC picture yep. of the life cycle. Yep. I'll have to put that link in for you, Laura. Now, Balmuthia is one of those even rarer uh, free-living amoebae that can, under very unusual circumstances, behave like a pathogen. But under ordinary circumstances, it wouldn't be bothered with you at all. Really? Yep. So in general, amoebal parasit uh, opportunistic amoebal infections of humans are very rare. They are extremely rare. And what's this Balmuthia? Balmuthia that she's. It's just another of. variety of free living amoeba that, uh, if it gains entrance into your body, it can cause harm. I'll bet if you're a little immunocompromised, you'll even be worse off, right? Always. I would always say that. All right, Dixon, thank you. Thank That's you for arranging this first triumvirate of TWIP. I, I think it was a good one. I think uh, people are going to be interested to hear what Bob has to say cool. about lots of subjects. He's got a good voice, too. He has a wonderful voice. and Speaks the next well. Time, maybe we'll get him to get a microphone and go onto the Skype network. Sure. But I sounded pretty good, actually. It's fine. not bad. They have a fine. good phone system at NIH. Yeah, I guess. and he, he, by the way, he, he, he lectured more than 20 years here. It must have been closer to 25 or 30 years because our book has been out for longer than that. So he used to come here <coughs> and give a yeah, guest lecture? Yeah, he used to come here uh, almost routinely in the spring when the course was offered, spend the night in New York City, see his kids, and then the next day give his lecture and then go back to Washington. And uh, I, it was delightful. It, it was a, a golden age for teaching parasitic mm -hmm. diseases at Columbia's medical school. Is that over? It's as far as I know it is, unfortunately. Sounds like it's not really appropriate to be over. But if all of these students will practice in the U.S., I guess. They can, of course, access these via the podcasts yeah. now. And in fact, that is what someone did say recently. They are learning parasitology from TWIP. Excellent. A medical student. We'll do you, the best we can. We do. You can find TWIP at microbeworld.org slash TWIP on iTunes or in the Zoom marketplace. And if you're new to TWIP, go on over to iTunes and put up a review. Just a few sentences or one sentence helps us stay on the front page so more people will discover us. And, of course, we do have an app for your iPhone or Android device. It's at microbeworld.org slash app. And I know Dixon purchased it for his new iPhone. Indeed. Yes, support the cause. Send us your questions and comments to twip at twiv.tv. Robert Guaz is at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is a division of the National Institutes of Health. And according to the lab page, he is the chief of the Laboratory of Malaria and Vector Research, although he said now he's the assistant chief. But either way, thank you, Dr. Guaz. Thank you, Dr. Despalmier. That's a pleasure. And as, as these letters indicate, by the way, I'd just like to say something yes. about the fact that we don't always get it right. Okay? We just don't always get it right. There are times where we have either lapses of memory or just knew that as it's something that was wrong that would turn out to be something else. Right. I must 
now announced to the public, listening public, I have no ego problems at all about making corrections to things that I've said. And I hope everybody else feels the same way because to error is human. Remember that. And as I like to write at the end of my emails, to forgive, nearly impossible. <laughs> but, uh, but for the most cases uh, of, of little factual corrections, I think we want to get it right. So if you hear something that I said or Vince said that was not correct, uh, feel free to, to jump right in because uh, that's how you start conversations and dialogues. We don't have any problem. None. With Zero. you telling us that we did something wrong. Not a bit. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org, verticalfarm.com, and medicalecology.com. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is it's parasitic. parasitic.